let's go on to the next piece. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll just quickly share a bit on what the history of a good space is. I'll pass on to Evelyn then to talk about what are some of the possibilities that uh, we can see as a, as a cooperative of change makers. Uh, and then we have some friends who have uh, kind of been with a good space since the start uh, and they will kind of share, you know, what their experience has been uh, here in a good space and what possibilities that being a co-op can unlock for all of us as change makers. Um, generally, this um, a good space actually started three years ago. That time it was really an experiment to cultivate active citizenry. And uh, we did three things. Uh, one was to basically host activities. So uh, some of uh, you might have attended some of these activities before. Uh, and these activities were really meant to um, expand perspectives of the public towards different social issues. So um, this is what we did. Um, we also had several programs where we um, gave small grants to encourage people to start projects. So instead of filling in like 10 page of uh, grant reports, right, you just need to come, you send us an email and then we, we give you funding. And But it was really about meeting the other people who applied for the funding. So you get this community of people to help you start a, a project. Uh, the last piece was really then we looked at um, this idea that actually no social issue is a single issue. And I think COVID-19 has really highlighted this, this, this uh, thing that say even in the migrant worker space, right? For a long time, the migrant worker organizations were working with one another, but now the mental health uh, of the brothers is at, is at a crisis level and it presents an opportunity for the mental health change makers to kind of intersect with the migrant worker change makers and see what they can do. So we had actually wanted to do that, facilitate some learning and collaboration across sectors for this sharing of wisdom, just as how you know we got a small taste of it earlier uh, with the ice breaking activity. Um, next, and yeah, so actually over time we grew into a group of about ninety two of us. Uh, they covered eleven issues, and you know in that two years plus they put on three hundred and thirty four activities. Uh, so if you look at that on on average, right, it's actually about twelve or fifteen a month. Uh, and they reached out to about 7,000 over uh, folks uh, to kind of engage them in different social issues. Um, next slide, please. And so actually the funding for this A Good Space previously we were funded by the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth and the National Volunteer Philanthropy Centre. So it came to an end in July 2019. So at that time, about 20 of us, right, uh, change makers from different in, uh, social issues came together and we created this dream, which you see in this photo here, uh, very nicely drawn by one of uh, the, the members who participated. Um, but really three themes came about. Um, they were asking like, how can a good space be sustainable? How can their own initiatives be sustainable? And how can we collaborate more? And actually it was at this time that an idea for a co-op was first suggested. At that time, we also didn't really know what a co-op was. Um, but, but Ash, uh, who's also on the call today, he actually came up with this idea uh, of, you know, of, of a model for collaboration and that's when it was first suggested. So now I pass on to Evelyn who will share more about uh, some of the things that we've observed since then. Evelyn. Hey, thanks Vincent. So hi everyone, I'm Evelyn. Um, so a little short uh, self-intro. Uh, I, I am a speech therapist and I'm here representing one, uh, the group that I founded, which is Aphasia Singapore. We support um, persons with aphasia, which is actually a communication disorder after a brain injury, um, such as stroke, you know, uh, brain tumor, brain trauma. Um, but today I'm also putting on a uh, different hat as a membership lead in a good space. So um, I'm going to share with you some of the challenges that we found that change makers, you know, whether you are um, helming a, a big non-profit organization or you're just starting a ground up group or just working on your own, um, these are some challenges that we found after, you know, um, yeah, Vincent and, and team actually you know, helped like a whole series of interviews last year in this whole process of coming, uh, coming together to form a co-op. So one, we, we realized that, okay, with grants, right, and many of us have actually tried tapping on grants, there are limitations. Uh, one of the biggest limitations is you can't use grant to pay manpower, uh, which is a real um, pain, uh, for lack of a better word, right? And, and it's often quite difficult to actually generate uh, revenue. So we are change makers and we want to do good and uh, the causes that we are advocating may be uh, very social and non-profit in nature. So it's quite hard to be sustainable and you know, find ways to actually pay ourselves. And uh, it's hard to get signups. Signups in terms of uh, volunteers, signups in terms of maybe participation if you're doing public outreach, um, and sometimes skilled volunteers, it's hard to come by. So that's one of the very real challenge. And, you know, we all want to advance our cause by finding a key opinion leader and influencer, but these people are also hard to come by. Um, so that's another area that, that was mentioned. And we know that venue space is, is extremely expensive in Singapore. Um, so, so for 
for myself, and I'm going to share a little bit more about this, uh, how I came into a good space was really because of space. <laughs> like, I took it very literally, like, we just needed a space. Yeah, that's how my group and my team actually came into the picture. Um, but I think, you know, the most important challenge that a lot of us feel is just being alone in our change-making journey, feeling very burned out, uh, when really it's not. You realise that hey, there are many other people on the same journey. Um, yeah, so, uh, Rumi, can I get the next slide? Yeah. And, and the other thing I mean we, we've noticed is we tend to work in silos so much, right? Because we're running ops and we are so, we are so focused on just the, the operations that we sometimes don't realise that there is actually a better way to do things. And the social issues we are, you know, we're advocating or we're advancing is really not a single issue. Um, and I think the, the existing change makers in a good space see that because we are system thinkers, we know that actually it's just not one issue. Yeah, so why, why do we want to have this co-op? So one, I think with the power of a cooperative, we can reach more people. Um, this is one case study that we have, and Ash is on the call and he will share more about the SG Gratitude Pack. It was actually put together um, very, very quickly, and it was actually quite amazing because we had features in the, the mainstream media and online media, um, and all that at no cost because we had the context to actually push this agenda. We felt that it was something important for the migrant um, brothers, and also we wanted to just show gratitude, you know, to the to the population. So we were able to reach um, a lot of people over social media, word of mouth contact, and this was really, I would say, one of the, the well, I think it was actually one of our pilot projects for a good space co-op because we just got co-opted very recently. Yeah, and yeah, so that's the media mention across yeah various you know mainstream and yeah Verita. Okay, next. So in terms of funding. So this is the part where we talk about the sustainability bit, right? Um, so even when it was a loose collective, you know, in 2018 and 2019, uh, we had unsolicited engagements, meaning there were companies that knocked on our, on our doors to say, hey, you know, we want to do CSR, we want to do uh, this and that. Can a good space actually organize this for us? Um, and that was when we were in a co-op, right? And altogether, uh, well, a, a total of about nearly, tw nearly 24,000 uh, dollars gen, uh, re revenue was generated la, and um, 14 change makers were engaged. So that was then. And going forward, this will be a very um, this will be a very deliberate piece. You know, we know that it is important to be sustainable and we know that we see ourselves um, playing AGS, right, a good space, playing the role of a conduit between corporate corporations, companies, private companies that has lots of resources. We all know they have plenty of money, plenty of resources. And we also see ourselves as um, a member of the civil society, right? So with our change, make, with our change makers and all that. And also we see ourselves as um, being a, a, a channel with the government. Um, our, our founder is Andrea, who is the um, former NNP. So she is definitely somebody who is a key, key opinion leader la, in, in this um, arena. And I think last but not least, right, it's really about harnessing the power of the community. So, um, mentioned so much about change makers. Imagine, I mean, in the past we had 92 and it was just a loose, it was a very loose group. There wasn't, there wasn't even like a membership. We just came together, like-minded people, and we made so many things happen. Um, I, later on, I'll share about how it's really helped me to advance uh, our team's course for aphasia. But there is so much wisdom and just so many opportunities for networking as well as just, um, you know, coming, like, great ideas are just, just coming together and, and um, a lot of things can happen. So it's no longer a single, you know, a single person journey. You feel like, okay, I'm not alone. I can actually get help from somebody else. So that is, that is the amazing thing, I mean, about having a co-op. Yeah, so I think that's my, that's my bit, you know, I hope, uh, if anyone has any question, please feel free to shout out at any time. I, this is very casual. Yeah, um, there'll be Q&A at the end, but just feel free to shout out as the slides are showing and you have questions. Yeah. If not, so I'm much. going to... Yeah. Thanks so I'm much, Amy. Pass... Hey, no worries. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to get um, a few people from the co-op to, to share about their experiences being in the co-op so that you can get a better idea of what is the impact of collaboration exactly. Uh, so our first speaker would be Ash. Ash, would you like to... Unmute yourself and switch on your video. Yes. Thanks, Remy. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, 
So let me first um, share a little about the SG Gratitude Pack for the benefit of those who may be the first time you're hearing about this. And then I'll describe how that idea was formulated and how it became a reality. And you'll be quite amused at how many twists and turns this uh, idea had to take before it came to its final form. And then I'll leave you with three um, reasons why I thought that this project would not have been as successful as it has been, if not for the fact that we came together under a good space. So, okay, so let me start the first point about uh, SG Gratitude Pack. So, as uh, even described, the main idea was that we encourage Singaporeans, it was a campaign that we went out to encourage Singaporeans to repurpose their National Day Fun Packs into a gift to migrant workers. So we're asking people to put things that they believe would be useful and would, uh, would be a gesture of thanks to them. It can be anything from canned food to handphones, used handphones to uh, toiletries. So whatever you feel that they can, they can find value in. So we, would, we went, reached out to the community mainly through social media and I was really, really amazed at the response that we got. Uh, at the end, we had um, over 200 people pledging to uh, take part in this program and we had more than 2,400 fun packs collected. So really in three weeks, I thought this was really quite a, a successful campaign in that it reached out to people and people were able to resonate with the cause and they got together to, to do this. And what was also very heartening was uh, it was not uh, 2,400 people giving a pack each. It was a smaller group, but people reaching out to their own community and gathering their friends, their families to contribute and then making that number happen. Okay, so this was the SG Gratitude Pack. Um, and essentially, this idea, now I'll tell you how this idea evolved, okay? And then you'll be quite uh, shocked. Okay, so as uh, Evelyn shared, I think uh, I'm actually part of a group called the Mother Earth Toastmasters and I've got two of my uh, fellow members here, Ihan and James on this call. So the Mother of Toastmasters is an environmental group. So this idea started from an environmental angle. Uh, we were, and it started from a place of frustration. So really we were very frustrated with this whole idea of Singapore, uh, the, uh, the NDP committee having to give uh, fun packs to every uh, Singaporean and, and PR, right? So we felt this was an immense waste of resources and we were trying very hard to lobby for it to to change in one form or the other. But as all of us know, um, the PACs, um, the NDP committee went ahead with still making the PACs, right? So the initial idea of this program was supposed to be a protest. We wanted to ask Singaporeans to not collect the fun pack, to show the government that Singaporeans are bigger than, uh, than we have outgrown this goodie bag mindset, right? So we wanted to lobby Singaporeans to say, uh, we don't need this fun pack, right? But I think at that point, it was more of a uh, frustration and then it was a protest statement. But through the discussion and uh, exchanging of ideas with the different people within a good space, and, and for me personally, I was not very familiar with the migrant worker issue, and, but listening to Vincent, Tines, and many, many more, it dawned on us that really this was an opportunity not to show frustration, but an opportunity to make a negative into a positive by showing gratitude, right? So it became very clear very quickly that this, pro, this campaign was not about a protest. This campaign was about uh, recognizing a group that has been forgotten, okay? So as we discussed, and then as, as this idea took a more positive slant, I think it created its own energy. So the three benefits, the first benefit I want to just say is that there's this cross-fertilization of ideas. So if it were just one silo group, environmental people thinking of what they want to do, it would have come across one angle only. But because we had the opportunity to talk and um, bounce the ideas across a wider group of uh, change makers, we could see a bigger opportunity. So I, I, I for one felt that the, this idea started like this and then it became a lot more than it, than it was at the beginning through the, the cross fertilization of ideas. The second um, big benefit to me was really um, 
if this project was to, was done by the Mother of Toastmasters, for example, or any environmental group, it would have not had that same adoption across society as if it was done through a good space. So a good space is a neutral, multi-issue platform. And therefore, it will have an easier way to connect with a broader community. So it's not just an environmental issue, it's not just a mental health issue, it's not just a migrant worker issue, it's everything. Right? So a good space provided that rather neutral platform that allowed us to uh, reach out to a wide range of supporting groups and then they came on board the bus. Right? So at the end of it, this project, although it was uh, led by a good space, it really could not happen the way it had, if not for the support from many, many groups. So we've got... Um, I think at least four or five different uh, migrant worker support groups that came on board to help to, to serve as collection points for the gratitude packs, as well as to serve to help us to distribute the packs to the, to the recipients. So really the second benefit is really that this is a neutral platform. It's a place that will, uh, that will be able to connect with a wider uh, base of issues. And then the last um, benefit for me personally was really the opportunity to work hand in hand with so many very passionate people. So I'm really happy that on this call, I've got Tines, I've got Vincent, I've got um, Evelyn and all these people who were really part in helping to make this idea come alive, right? And I think there's a power when, I think um, Evelyn mentioned that um, it can get lonely after a while when you're doing your thing, right? That you um, don't you don't feel like it's uh, that the others share the same passion. But in doing this project, I could see different change makers in action side by side, that which otherwise I would have no chance to to uh, have a glimpse of, right? And I can just say that it's been very very inspiring. Uh, the amount of sacrifice, the amount of uh, creativity um, and the amount of tenacity to just keep pushing till the thing is done. Uh, and, and a big shout out to Tenes for one, right? He was, I think, the single-handed, uh, I think at some point of his of his of, the, of, the, of this whole period, I think he may not even know where his bed is because the rooms, must, his bedroom must have been so full with packs that he cannot even find his uh, his uh, his bed. Yeah, but really the third, the third point I want to just emphasize is that the good, a good space, if we are able to all embrace it, we will be, form a community of really truly inspiring people. And being part of that group will have an inspirational effect on the rest of us. Right? And I think this inspiration is invaluable in the work we do because we're not doing this for the money, we're doing this for the impact. And sometimes it gets tough and um, what you really need is just to know that someone else shares that belief and someone else is uh, maybe three steps ahead of where you are. And if you can get there, then surely you can too, right? So really, these are the, the three benefits I just wanted to tell everybody. I think these are points that uh, Evelyn and the rest have already touched on. Um, the first point is the fact that we've got many people together. We can cross-fertilize ideas so that um, our good idea will become better. Right? And the second point is, um, being a neutral platform, a good space allows us to connect and resonate with a broader uh, target group, as opposed to if we were to just do what we do in our own space. Okay? And then the last is really this opportunity to come together as like-minded change makers, and, um, and then providing support and insp inspiration to one, to one another. All right, so that's my sharing. Thank you so much, Ash, for your perspective. Evelyn, uh, are you ready to go? Yes, yes. Take it Thank away. Asha. That's great, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to flash some slides. Um, can you guys see it? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, I wanted to share just a little bit more about my personal story, or not really my personal story, la, but our team's personal story. So that's my core team. Uh, we are a bunch of speech therapists who's very passionate about raising public awareness about aphasia, as well as um, empowering persons with aphasia. So I'm not going to talk too much about what aphasia is, but um, 
it's it's really it's really very hidden. One third of um people who suffer from stroke actually will have communication difficulties called aphasia. So this is something that um you know as a as a practicing speech therapist I work with on pretty much a daily basis. So we really want to do something to support them. So how we came into a good space was because um in the past pre COVID days. We started in 2018, we were a grown-up group, we just wanted to organize a support group for persons with aphasia. Um, but we didn't want to organize like an ordinary support group, so we organized something called Chit Chat Cafe. And, and Chit Chat Cafe uh, really is like a pop-up um, cafe concept, and anyone with aphasia and their caregivers could come in and have a coffee and, and um, interact. Uh, and, and the conversations are actually facilitated by speech therapist volunteers. Um, and then a friend said, hey, you know, there's this, there's this thing called a good space, write into them and ask for a space. So we did, and that was how our journey began. Um, and, and over the last, I would say like a year, uh, I think I found a good space early, early 2019. Over the year, I think it's given, you know, we came in wanting to use the space, but it's given us so, so much more. Yeah, in ways that you know, I'm really trying to put it into words, but it's really much more. So, Kela, this is the very practical bit. Like, there's tangible benefits, but there's been meaningful collaboration and also inroads to new audiences and just so much more. I'm going to use pictures. So that's us. And if you've been to um, MVPC in the past, this was the, the venue, you know, and um, it was a great, great space. Uh, and they was, I mean, Vincent, Vincent and, you know, has been so kind and so supportive of our movement from the start. Uh, every month we would have our persons with aphasia, our participants come in with their caregivers. So that's our choir performing and they really miss it because it's COVID now. One of them just texted me yesterday to say, when can we do our our face-to-face -face chit chat again because now everything's virtual, you know. Uh, so that was at the start, tangible benefits. Um, but there were other things that came along. Um, last year then, you know, Vincent said, oh, you know, we do this annual outreach thing where it's called a good day. and that was really new to us, you know, at Aphasia SG. And our experiences working with other groups hasn't been very pleasant because we reached out to other uh, other organizations and, and you know, we, we came in with a bit of like a, okay, we're a bit wary because every man for himself kind of thing. At least that was how I felt, like every, every man, every woman for himself. Uh, but, you know, at good space, really, people are, I, I mean, the change makers, I think it's just been an incredible journey. Everyone's been really open. Uh, very willing to collaborate, very willing to share, and uh, very impact-driven, very outcomes-driven. Yeah, so that, that to me is amazing. It's almost like a different mindset from if you have worked with government agencies, or sorry, I mean, if you're working in government agency, I'm sorry, but you know how it is, right? Like, it's, it's just all these red tape, but, you know, when you collaborate with change makers, it's none of that. So we did a good space, which was an amazing outreach event for us, and we had so many good um, leads that generated from the event. So um, other things, we, we organize other things, but uh, the point is, you know, fellow change makers actually support and some of them actually attended the, the, the movie screening that we did. And this was all pre-COVID. So now that it's COVID, right, um, you know, of course, everything's moved online, but also there are opportunities, right? Uh, and, and sometimes when you least expect it. So with Happiness Initiative, which, I mean, what does, what does happiness have to do with this? you know, our cause, right, aphasia. But we actually found an opportunity to, to collaborate, to partner. Um, it was the opening event for our Aphasia and Awareness Month in uh, June because a, a happiness initiative led by Sherman and Simon, they're very, they're like big movie buffs and, and they also, they are also part of the film society. So we actually found a, a film about uh, aphasia and we did a Netflix party and invited the director and did like a virtual dialogue, a, a post-show dialogue. And that's amazing. It was, it was so well attended and yeah, just, just awesome. Um, other things that we have done with other change makers, uh, and, and you know, there's a lot more, but these are the few that I thought were really fun and we just did it recently. Uh, we did a Read for Books 2020. This was the, the uh, with Be Kind SG movement and also Autoimmune uh, is with Sherry, one of our change makers. And she introduced us to uh, the the friends, the befrienders from IMH, the Achievers. And, um, you know, one thing leads to another, and then the Achievers actually invited our choir to actually do a Zoom performance for the long-term residents at um, IMH. So it's just really nice how things move organically and we have opportunities as well. Um, and the other one, and Louis is going to talk next, uh, Louis and team actually ran a uh, National Day Grown Up Party, another amazing event. We're so lucky to have airtime. Um, these are my team members and volunteers. They... They actually went on the event um, in the human library to share about 
uh, aphasia and, and the journey of persons with aphasia and caregivers. And all these would not have happened if not for a good space. Um, other things, you know, uh, so we talked a little bit more about the corporate gigs, right? Um, Vincent actually was approached by SingPost a couple of months back. They said they wanted to do like an uh, outreach event, uh, not outreach, but more like, uh, like a CSR for their staff. And, um, you know, Vincent opened it up to the change makers. Anyone wants to pitch, you know, for a project for the staff of SingPost to learn about social causes. So our team actually, you know, sent in a proposal and they picked us. So um, Aphasia SG will be talking to, you know, doing a workshop for SingPost staff and all that wouldn't have happened, you know, if not for a good space once again. That's, so that's more on the Aphasia Singapore front. And on the personal front, I mean, it's really a lot of personal growth and just meeting like-minded people, meeting, you know, amazing people, friendships. Um, and it's really quite, quite cute. Like, it's, you know, sometimes the friendships are very, very uh, unexpected. So like on the left, you know, uh, one of our, so that's from a, on the right is a picture from a good day. And on the left, uh, Sarah, she's a certified laughter yoga coach. And she just said, okay, you know what? I'm going to run a laughter yoga session for you guys. Y'all come and attend. I'll teach you how to do laughter yoga. So just like that, I also learned how to do laughter yoga. So it's just fun. Yeah. Thank you so much, <laughs> Evelyn. Uh, laughter yoga sounds, sounds very fun indeed. <laughs> I can do it for you also. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. Last but not least, we have Louis, um, who's going to share more about his experience at AGS. Yeah. Hi, guys. So, uh, Louis, I run this social enterprise called uh, Praxium. We largely work with youth and try to help them to figure out what kind of careers they want to get into. Uh, and we do work with schools, but I think underlying this uh, work with youth, right, uh, what our social mission really is, is to try and take a look at this education system that almost all of us went through and think like, is this really what we need? Uh, and that's kind of why I moved into like career development, all that kind of stuff too, because I think at the end of the day, we live our lives, we, our careers define a big part of it. And my work is trying to help figure out like, what is your purpose in life? What are you trying to do? How do you lead a fulfilling life that you enjoy? Uh, that's my work. Lah. And when I kind of came into um, a, a good space, right? Uh, I think it's similar to Evelyn, right? We came in, we we are very used to like the world that we live in, where every man for himself, you got to find your own opportunities and stuff like that. Uh, and I was pleasantly surprised that uh, a good space was quite different. So if I fast forward a little bit, right, um, just now uh, Evelyn ended off by saying that we have quite a bit of fun and we play around a little bit. So I think between like uh, me, uh, another member called Kathy, another one called Sherman, sometimes we'll have like game sessions and all that. And if you, if you do join, you will find that uh, a couple of us will always be like playing games every now and then, every month or every two months or something. And that really helps in building the bonds and relationships among us. Uh, so the couple of stuff that I'm going to share, right, I, I noticed that they, they all have something to do with playing something. And I don't know whether that's because of me or something. Um, but I'll just share a few uh, projects that came about because of A Good Space. Uh, I think A Good Day was mentioned. A Good Day 2019 was mentioned. Uh, these are some pictures from that particular session. If you are curious what this woman laughing about, right? Actually, on this table, uh, there's nothing but paper and dice. But we were playing like this game called like Dungeons and Dragons. But it was adapted from um, to fit some form of a social cause. So, in this game, right, they are playing some fantasy characters. So uh, you see like this one setting, like, just sitting around a table with paper and rolling dice. Uh, and they are playing these characters, these fantasy characters. And it almost seems like there's nothing special or unique about this. Like, this is just like some game, right? Um, but what happened was that in this game, we set a particular environment and scenario. And we let players decide what they want to do on their own accord. They can do whatever they want. Uh, and invariably, right, every single group of people who played uh, went to rob, they went to kill, they went to murder, got one group even prostituted like one of their members just to earn money in the game. So all the horrible things come up, okay? So the, you might be thinking, what's the social cause in this? And uh, really, if you actually take a look at these characters, any of you who work with youth, right, you will find that actually some of these descriptions about um, these characters, they are reminiscent of what you might see among some youth at risk. Uh, just how you might describe them. Uh, and in this particular game, what we are trying to convey is the idea that for um, any of your youth who get into trouble, any person in general who gets into trouble and commits crime and vices, generally the environment is what shapes them and moves them towards uh, committing these acts. Lah. 
So um, I think in this game, when we got the public to kind of uh, engage with the game, have fun and just go about this, right? Um, they themselves became uh, kind of complicit in all these crimes that they commit in their fantasy settings. And we kind of ended it off, right, with uh, someone who himself uh, either came out of prison or was in rehab or uh, came from a boys hostel or something and share about his own life experience and how all those fun and games that people had in the, the fictional game, right, actually happened in real life. And the motivations are very similar. So uh, I think one of the members, this youth at risk, who came forward to share, um, he was saying, you know that thing about like you prostitute your friend to earn money, that kind of thing? That really happened. And when the audience kind of heard that, they were like, oh shit, this is, this is real. This is not just some make-believe thing. Some, this is actually someone's life. And uh, they can kind of see then the connection to all these things. Uh. And this whole thing, right, wouldn't have cut, it came about very randomly. It came about because of one of these AGS sessions, right? This is the very unglam side of the work, right? Where you're just in a meeting room, kind of like flip chart paper, thinking and writing some stuff down. And uh, one of the, the, a few of the members decided, hey, we care about youth at risk. Uh, we want to include some form of a game element. And I actually wasn't there at the meeting. Uh, what happened was that I think Vincent or someone messaged me to say, hey, there's this group. They are doing something about youth. Uh, they want to do some games related thing. Do you want to contribute or help? So I joined the second meeting and then we kind of got together. With, uh, and it's really a, a random com combination of different members in the space at the time. And we just came together to deliver this lah. And that was pretty fun. And it was a nice uh, first encounter that I had in terms of how collaborative the community is. How we really came from different walks of life and we really uh, came together, put a lot of effort into making something work. Uh, and that really addresses the other point about loneliness because you, you almost always feels like you're the only one who cares about things. Uh, and in this setting, I know that um, I have a whole gang of people at, at my back or wherever, right? in a good space who care similarly. And if I'm ever down, I know they pick me up. Um, the other bit which happened more recently uh, was this National Day event that Evelyn shared a little about. There's a little bit of history to this. Uh, last year, uh, me and some friends, we decided uh, we want to hang out for National Day because that sense of community was building among us, right? So we we're saying, hey, let's just hang out, lah. like National Day. Let's, I mean, there's NDP, but NDP is like very, you know, formal and stuff like that, right? So we wanted to just have a hangout, play games, kind of chit-chat, talk about social causes, talk about the things that we believe in, uh, and kind of define like what does Singapore mean to us as change makers particularly. So we ran this particular event last year. Uh, a random fun fact, um, it was like out of our own pocket and stuff. Uh, then at the end of the event, we asked for donations if people want to help us cover costs. We earned a total of $3.84 uh, in profit that cover after covering all our costs. So we said, oh no, we got $3.84. We have to use this money next year. So we decided to run a follow-up event this year uh, with that $3.84. Uh, and we ran this online event. Uh, this event, we made a profit of about, I think, $50 to $80. So we are on an uptrend, we are getting somewhere with this. Uh, in any case, a couple of us, we all came together, a um, couple of social enterprises, and we basically tapped on a good space for uh, some members to kind of run uh, some sections. Lah. So um, how it would have been, what actually happened was a three-day event where um, there was like schedule. So you just now you, meant, uh, you heard Evelyn mentioned about how uh, they had members come in to speak about uh, issues that they care about and uh, other change makers as well. And I think in our audience, there's Zhong Han is also here. Um, there are some other folks who joined in and had this conversation with us. And they shared about all the causes that they believe in. This is just day one of like human library. In day two, we had some breakout activities. So that Dungeons and Dragons, that role-playing game I mentioned, we brought it back again this year. Then we ran some other things, like uh, this was my own personal uh, geeking out about National Day, uh, the songs. So I just broke down the National Day songs for people interested. And we have a bunch of other stuff. Then uh, the National Day itself, we had a whole host of like mixed activities from, uh, again, human libraries from different set of folks, as well as uh, activities and all that as well. And there are some like fringe activities also, so, lah, where people can write a message, play some games, that kind of thing. Uh, so this is one of the events that uh, we came together to do. Um, this was just a little like thing that emerged from there, just from geeking out, right? So you could have attended the event by, uh, let's say, going to this directory, right, and clicking to enter a Zoom call. But we also wanted to 
have this other experience, right? And this was where we managed to rally some of our tech friends, right, who were interested to be a bit more in tune with the social causes as well. So the tech friends who I put in to build this particular interface, which is actually quite playful and fun, because you can come and then you can browse this space, and then uh, you can kind of enter the same calls as just now. It's just a different way to navigate. Uh, so in order to build this, I had to pull in some tech friends, and the tech friends were saying, oh, no, I spent don't know how much time uh, trying to do this thing about like aphasia, about this other thing, then now I know so much more about it as I built this thing. <laughs> so it's quite amusing. Um, regardless, um, uh, this was like a, a work of love, a work of passion that a lot of people came together to share in this effort to create this particular event. Uh, as we are doing this, I also just want to do a short little uh, audio share because one of the people we brought in, uh, he was an NS boy who uh, was waiting to ORD as all NS boys. Um, and one of the side projects he did was to arrange the National Day songs into a medley, which we took and then we converted into this platform, which became like a background track if you do and did come onto this platform. Let me fast forward to uh, some more memorable songs. If any of you are interested in this, you can let me know, then I'll send you the link or something. Then you can listen to the 12-minute medley that he created. Um, but basically, this was like a bunch of people coming together to just like contribute for Singapore and stuff. Uh, yeah, so I think in the end, we had some folks just come in to play games and stuff like that as well. Just an uh, opportunity for people to come together, be involved in social good, or just get to know more people in general. Um, and there's like a whole Facebook uh, Instagram page where we had some photos of what happened on the day itself. Uh, this is just for archiving and record sake of all the people and all the stuff that happened. Uh. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you, Louis. Oh, I really, really love the medley. Thank you also for like playing it for everyone to listen to. Yeah, um, so let's move on. Thank you to all the speakers for sharing your experiences. Uh, I'm going to hand the time over to Vincent. Uh, so I'm mindful of time, uh, so we really want to leave like the last 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, and feel free to stay if you have more uh, questions. So, so I'll just jump through this piece really quickly. Uh, but just, just to kind of say one thing to, to kind of close off what uh, Louis, uh, Ash and Evelyn shared. Uh, thank you very much. It was quite nice to hear everyone's journey over the last two years. And I think we've became very uh, good, good friends. But more importantly, I, I, I think the possibilities that they've uh, discussed right, really shows that we are really stronger together. And I think, you know, all of us, you know, just now when you guys were in the breakout rooms, you were also discussing that we we're quite excited that, you know, if with new folks joining in the co-op, when you bring in your strengths, your experience, your, and your wisdom, we can be even stronger. Um, this is, you know, some of the things that they shared was the organizing activities together, but very, very, um, you know, we, there are so many other possibilities that we as a co-op can do, uh, which I will talk about uh, now. Um, so actually we designed the membership options. Right? So there are three membership options. After all our interviews, we identified three different stages of um, change makers and we designed the membership options according to each uh, tier. Lah. So the first stage is someone who's just starting out, someone who's just hoping to learn about social issues. So some of the member benefits here are more centered around like getting them into the community, uh, meeting the other change makers, um, getting uh, opportunities to do internships or, or volunteer with different AGS change makers, and being able to attend workshops to learn about change making skills. So this is kind of like the first membership option for $120 a year. Um, the second one right, is uh, we also observe that there is a stage of change making where they are just starting out their first projects. The planning horizon is not long, so maybe like one year or they're planning event to event. And what they really need here right, is this kind of first push and a supportive community to get started. Um, and so we, we had some of the member benefits here are uh, centered around like uh, giving them an opportunity to get feedback from other members in a good space on their ideas to refine it further. Um, a bit like how uh, Ash and uh, kind of Louis and Ethan did with their events. Um, they also need uh, some uh, reach and sign ups you know, now that they are starting their uh, first few projects. So uh, the member benefits are centered around that. And lastly, a lot of them actually start by applying for funding. So we actually want to bring the, the funders right, into the same room uh, with the people who want to apply for projects and get them to share, you know, what is your thought process like when you fund? Uh, what are some things that I need to look out for? So this is the second uh, tier. And then the third tier is actually the, uh, this is for a stage of members, right? If you 
are in a space where you are stable, your planning horizon is maybe somewhere in the three to four year kind of space, you're thinking strategically, um, you want to engage in strategic change and you're looking at sustainability, not just financially, but also operationally. Um, at this stage, the change makers will either be working in a non-profit organization or they are running their uh, organization as a social enterprise full, full time or they are very heavily invested in their ground up. The focus of the benefits here right, is really looking at uh, financial sustainability, so opening up uh, more spaces for revenue or additional funding opportunities through some of the corporate projects that we spoke about earlier. The second thing is something that we are really excited by, which is as a collective, we can actually meet the ministers. And this is something that we kind of learned uh, recently uh, when we uh, were the signatory on several uh, statements uh, on the emerging stronger task force that the government set up. Um, actually, as a collective, right, we actually got Minister Desmond Lee to uh, reply. And I think this is the role that a good space, um, that the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth in Singapore, MCCY, sees a good space playing as well. to be the safe third space, uh, that neutral space for the civil society change makers like us to engage with the, with the government officials. Individually, if to be very honest, if I alone wanted to meet a minister, maybe the minister will say like, hey, who are you? But you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a collective, right, we can have this, this power to engage in a space, to uh, engage in a policy level discussion with the ministers or even key uh, opinion leaders as well. And the last piece also is this idea of operational sustainability. Uh, many of you here, at this stage, you'll be thinking, like, how can I grow my team? I can't do this alone. How can I build a system? Uh, so one of the things that we want to do here is, of course, uh, also to help you recruit uh, qualified volunteers, interns, or even employees to sustain the impact. Uh, and this slide, the next one, right? Um, so these are different members, uh, options for membership. And this slide is actually how a co-op differs from uh, other organizations. So uh, this is how a co-op differs from a charity, this is how it differs from a social enterprise, how it differs from a society, in the sense that a cooperative, I realize we haven't actually really said what a cooperative is, but essentially it is a social enterprise that is owned by its members. Uh, it is a social enterprise that is non-profit that is owned by its members. So what does that mean? Um, a co-op right, is mandated um, by, by, by the law uh, to, to, to basically, uh, at the end of the year when we have a financial surplus, the members will actually vote to decide um, how the financial surplus is distributed. The members can also receive dividends from these financial surplus. The members can also vote on key issues uh, in the core and even stand for election. And we decided to um, go with this uh, as a core rather than a charity or social enterprise. We feel like this idea of ownership is really important. Uh, we want members to own it. We want, mem we want this to belong to, to everyone, not just like one or two people. Um, and it is the first co-op in Singapore uh, for change makers. There are co-ops for, I mean, are, that NPC is Singapore's biggest co-op. There's co a lot of co-ops for credit services, but a co-op of change makers in Singapore and in, in Asia, based on our research, this is the first. And we all have a very unique opportunity uh, of being the pioneer in this uh, space. Um, but we do have this co-owner option. So um, as a co-owner, uh, you have to buy shares. And the, uh, the kind of rule that we set here right, is that uh, co-owners have to own a minimum of 100 shares. But once you have shares, essentially you can do these three things and you actually own the co-op. Uh. And we have this one-time offer uh, for, two, for 2020. We, any members who select the grow category, um, when you contribute, make the membership contribution on the grow category earlier, you will also receive a one-time bonus of 100 shares. So that will instantly make you a co-owner and you also get to enjoy the grow member benefits. So that's, that's where we are uh, coming from. Um, I think this uh, just the last piece before we go into um, questions, right? Uh, yes, Rami mentioned that actually these member benefits, you can see it at this uh, website that Rami has just posted. Um, it's still being refined uh, and we will continue to refine it with your feedback uh, if you join. We really want this to continue to evolve. This is an emerging piece. Um, before we go into the q and I just want to say one last thing, which is actually member benefits aside. Um, I, I said this earlier on the call as well. COVID-19 has really highlighted that no social issue is a single issue. And we urgently, urgently need to build towards a more collaborative future for change making in Singapore. And together, right, when we come together, we are so much stronger. We can create projects that are richer, they are more meaningful. And as this Singapore's first co-op, each of us, when we join, we actually have an opportunity to be a pioneer. Um, but it's not easy. Um, to be very honest, we will have more questions than answers. Uh, it is, there is no precedent. It's the first time that someone has ever, a, a, a group of us has ever started a co-op for change making. Um, but I you know, believe that we choose to do it not because it is easy, but precisely because it's hard. You know, just like any sailor setting sail for a distant land or any entrepreneur creating a new business, right? anything that is worth doing will be, always be hard. But what we want to invite you to do is to invite you to come and plant this seed for a more collaborative future for change making and 
for change makers now and in the future. And then hopefully one day we can all sit under this tree and enjoy the shade. So thank you very much for coming to listening, uh, for coming to listen to, to what we have to share. Uh, we're now going to the Q&A segment. Uh, as I said you know, earlier, you know, let, let's try to find the answers together. We, we may not have all the answers, but we are committed to exploring this together with everyone. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thanks, thanks, Vincent. Yeah, <laughs> that's so awesome. I really like your reference to the. That's a, it, it's referencing from a Chinese saying, right? The sit down and enjoy the shape. I think I, I at least I know I see a few of my friends in this space, and I invited you guys to to come in because I truly believe that we all share the vision. Even though you know, uh, I haven't talked so much about a good space before because it was a very loose affiliation, but. I think we all share this common vision of wanting to build a better Singapore and there I say a better world, you know, and, and this is something that I see very, um, you know, a common thread among all the, the existing change makers and I'm so excited to actually have new, new people coming on board, you know, yeah. yeah. So if, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask and we can discuss that together. You can also drop it in the chat if you want. Are there any, uh, just, just curious, are there any like upcoming projects or initiatives that EGS is working on uh, in the next six months? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so actually one of the pieces is the migrant worker space. Uh, there urgently needs to be a mental health response there. So what we are thinking about doing with MOM, right, is um, actually the, the brothers won't be able to go back to Little India uh, anytime soon. So what they are doing is they will basically have exit passes for the brothers to go to recreation centers. So there's eight recreation centers across Singapore, uh, mostly in the West, uh, one in Woodlands, but it's mostly in the West. Um, so what MOM is kind of thinking of doing AGS and Jurong Town Council, which manages five of these recreation centers, is to engage a good space uh, as a collective, right, for us to propose some activities that we can run for the brothers, uh, whether physically or virtually. And we will push for this to be funded, uh, meaning that as a change maker, you also get some funding uh, to run your, your project. Right? But I, I think this one was one of the really interesting ones that we saw that actually the power of a collective. I, I think individually, MOM and JTC may not engage like each of us, like it will be quite difficult, but as a collective, you know, I think that's a project that we really want to look at. Uh, and that is coming up, it's quite urgent, uh, the, the next month or so, we are already laying the groundwork for that. And just waiting for the members to come in before we roll this out together. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Mm. Go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted yeah, to say yeah, hi, hi. Uh, yeah, I, I th thanks, thanks for the sharing uh, as, 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 as per everyone. Um, I, I just have a question because I'm like, uh, I mean, I, I run a fintech startup that happen, that is not funded, but happens to have, uh, that I'm happen to ex be exploring a social business to the entire company. So just wondering, you know, um, if there are any public events on networking, you know, like over Zoom, for example, that, you know, non-members can also participate and try to, you know, soak in a little bit of the whole culture. Thank you for that, Kang. I remember DOSCON.SG. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that that's, just a, that's just a fun website because I like to, I like to hop domains. That's like one of my hobbies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and now also with uh, Kang, Kang also started a swap, Swappy, right? Swappy.SG. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, some of the folks on the call might find that interesting. Uh, Raymond or even Denise, uh, maybe Kang Liang, if you could drop in your, your, yeah, sure. your, your link there. Yeah. If you want to respond to Kang Liang's question, uh, any directions for non-members too? Uh, yeah, hang on. Uh, yeah, because I'm, I'm responding to the one on the chat. <laughs> oh, there's okay. a question about, yeah. Ah. Yeah, so there's a question about, uh, yeah, the uh, societies. So, Individuals can sign up. In fact, if you are signing up as a, if you are representing a um, organization, you can. Mm. But the if you buy shares, it will be to you and not the not the society or the or the entity that you are representing. Does it make sense? So the individual yeah. will actually own the shares, yeah, okay. and not okay. the company. Mm. Okay, and because my company is still not funded yet, right? And so so I don't have money to do any to pay for membership, for example, right? So um, just wondering, you know, if there are yeah. free resources that I can be a free rider on. 
<laughs> yes, yes. There, there, I mean, there, 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 there are still uh, activities that will be open to the public. I, I think we, we, we can, we do have some public activities run by the members themselves. So you can participate mm -hmm. in that if you like. Uh, we do have some that uh, will be free as well for non-members. Okay. Um, there are also uh, financial assistance uh, options uh, uh, for those who want to join. But so we, we don't want to let money be a factor, but we do recognize that, I mean, the practicalities is we do need some funds to sustain the uh, a good space co-op as well. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that we have been exploring with some of the members who have been quite financially affected by COVID. Okay. Uh, we are doing, uh, currently it's quarterly installments. Okay. And if we can secure funding from some of the bigger agencies, right, we might even do scholarship options. Right? I see. So can, it be a, can it also be a butter trade? So instead of providing money, I provide services, for example. But case by case, of course. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't want to make you I don't want to make you say yes to this in a public domain and you know everyone comes and asks you for butter trade. So uh, no, actually Kana, we did explore that option. We did yeah. explore the butter trade <laughs> option because it would be be so nice, right? But I think right now, um the, because the co-op is uh, just starting out, mm. we don't have the, the process in, I mean, like we cannot, um, yeah, I, I think butter trade is a bit too administratively difficult for us to incorporate sure. at this moment. Yeah, sure. but like what Vincent mentioned, yeah. installments, mm. and we do have uh, the plan, I mean, once we actually amass um, more funds, right, to actually give out scholarships to um, yeah, like change makers whom we feel really would be a valuable asset to the to the whole collective. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So definitely sure. we, we hear you. We hear you sure. on that. Yeah. Sure. Then fingers crossed I would raise some money and then I could join with like as per a normal member. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Vincent, if I'm not wrong also, right? Each tier sure. of membership was designed for different readiness of people as well. Yes. So um at the tier that you are probably qualified or able to participate in. The resources available there would be most appropriate for your work at that point in time also yeah. sure sure yeah understand mm. cool thanks thank thanks. you yeah. thank you Kang Liang. and and actually to to build on uh just now Tong Tong Han's earlier point as well right um the 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 kind of suggestion of projects doesn't necessarily have to come from a good space uh, it can come from each and every one of us. Say like what, what Ash has, has done with the SG Gratitude Pack, he had an idea, he mobilized four or five of us in the community. So that's, that's something that each of us right, as members we can do. And mm -hmm. you will have the platform to do. Uh, I, I feel like maybe one of our roles as the A Good Space working team, so myself and uh, Remy, we are the full-time staff of this uh, co-op. But I, I think most of the work is really kind of holding this space right, for us to become friends, for us to build trust with one sure. another, for us to build relationships so that we can mobilize together. Mm. So, mm. like for example, Tong Han, you have that uh, whole uh, idea of wanting to convene the ecosystem for a mental health uh, kind of segment, right? Uh, that could be done with, with the folks here. I mean, today there's uh, Owen and a few others who are passionate about mental health. So, you could very easily form a working team to look at that. Or uh, even what Kang Liang's suggestion is uh, on, you know, could we do a, a butter trade? If there are two or three members who are interested, we can form a working team to, to, to explore that and then we put it to a vote uh, and, mm. and it, gets, it gets implemented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I like the flexibility because everybody's a great stage here, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. cool, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kang Liang. I uh, just want to do a shout out to Bangkit, who is here with us today. Um, they are from the Singapore National Cooperative Federation. So if you've got any questions about what a cooperative is, you can direct it to Bangkit. Yeah. Uh, Bangkit as well. Don't leave my boss last thing one. Okay. Sorry, where? Um, Where is your boss? Sorry, I cannot find it. No, but yeah. Oh, Singhwat. Okay, yes, I see you now. Boss, yeah, Mankit and Singhwat. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves. Okay, uh, I think uh, this uh, give a short introduction. So, uh, Singhwat and myself, we are from the Singapore National Cooperative Federation. So as you have known by now, a good space is a cooperative itself. First thing, and also they are also part of our affiliates. Also, uh, so we are the apex body for cooperative movement in Singapore. So, uh, you, you have anything regarding the regulation of cooperative, like I think one of the participants asked about is it a legal entity or something, all these things you can just drop by and ask us uh, by through, I think, email or I mean, email, I think Vincent got our email and phone numbers, you all can just drop if you are very shy, uh, you can just drop an email to me, we can answer to you, or if you have any question regarding the, the shareholders, uh, what is the right of a cooperative so and so forth, you all can just uh, drop by and ask myself. Uh. So if we don't know, we will, we will, we will file for you. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe I can share a thought that I have uh, regarding a good space. Uh, I think uh, I think both both me and Monkey, I think journey with Vincent uh, and to a certain extent until so for the past one year, right? <laughs> until like until like early part of this year, finally, right? We all get registered. I think I think it's a very interesting journey. So whereby you are exploring whether a co-op is a model that you want to embark on. And we also share with you what really a co-op is really about. Um, so, so the, and, and, and to the observation of what you have done, uh, I, I shared with Vincent before, I'm, I'm actually very amazed with all the things and skill set that you have. Or like, 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 the, like the get together thing. I say, wow, this sort of project being put together Actually, it can be monetized, so I know. <laughs> it can, you know. The quality of the program and the, the type of activities that you all run to do good, uh, actually, all of these things, in a way, in, to a certain extent, can monetize. So, you see, the, the whole concept of co op is, is a do well and do good enterprise. Uh, all right? it's, it's not just about doing good, all right? doing good society and then not earning money and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, former boss always say a dolly, I think Vincent met her before. She's, she always tell us, okay, co-op doesn't have to be a soft story. So it's not a soft story, correct? So it's okay to, in a way, monetize what you all have. But of course, the principle is not to maximize profit. But of course, you need to have surplus so that you can pay salary for Vincent and Rainy music. So, so I was always worried about when about Vincent's salary or when, when, when he's going to get his next salary. Right. So, so in a way, when co-op, when AGS is being started and, and you all have a full-time staff that actually coordinate all these things and bring all the, all the respective members together, I think it's important also to leverage on each other uh, strength and see what type of program that you all can, in a way, monetize and, and, and help each other. Because I think some of you run your respective social enterprise, all right? So one idea which I suggested to Vincent quite some time back is uh, a, a AGS can actually curate a uh, chargeable program based on all the respective skill sets that you have, targeting at the respective segment, right? be it uh, be it youth at risk, be it uh, speech therapy, things like that. And all these things actually, if, if curated properly, can be positioned as a, as a service mainly to the corporate. Uh, because if you talk about such service, the corporate are the one that actually have the budget to pay for it, if not the school segment. Uh, so, so, so there's some initial thoughts that I have uh, regarding how, how, do you all, how do you all do well at, at the same time in addition to doing good, all right? So that, so that at, at the end of the day, you all, have, you all can self-sustain through all the things that you have done to do the activities you all want to do, all right? Yeah. Of course, the other avenue is what Vincent has mentioned, uh, funding. Uh, or funding whereby, as a co-op, when you all come together to do certain activities, you all can apply for funding from the respective agencies. Uh, but the do well part, I think, is a challenge that you all can think about. You see how leveraging on all the respective skill sets that you all have, how can you all create or curate a service that you all can position to the, to the, to the market. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Sing Huat and Mangkit for sharing your perspectives. In fact, um, this corporate partnership piece um, is something that A Good Space is looking to do as well. And it's something that we will develop la, as a way of getting more revenue for the change makers that join us. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, Remy, if I may just add one comment. Thank sure. you uh, for sharing that. Um, I, I think most change makers are not very focused on making money. Would that be fair? But all of us want to be able to do what we want, what we think is meaningful as the main job. So if the co-op is designed as a structure distinct from a society, society, nobody needs to make money, but in a co-op, there's ownership and therefore there's a profit agenda. So I think this is an important point that I'm, I'm hearing and I, I think we need to make sure that this is a central part of our direction we need to be able to empower the change makers in our group to be able to monetize their programs 
so that there is uh, a sustainable, when I say sustainable, I'm not referring to the environmental sustainable, I'm referring to the financial sustainability of this, of, of what we are trying to do. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Uh, and um, I, I think I'm, I think some of us can you know just use our corporate background, very for profit corporate background, you know, to add on on ideas on how to how to milk the corporate or how to even milk consumers even. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, can I ask? Uh, because like Mother Toastmasters Club, uh, we don't have a legal entity, so sometimes when we want to uh, run programs with corporates and they have some money they prefer to give uh, but yeah. <laughs> they need to sign contracts or that or send to a corporate bank account which we yeah. are able to do so if we are like if like one of us is a member of a good space can we kind of like borrow like the bank account of a good space yeah, that's a great point that you raised, Han. Uh, it's actually one of the challenges that we heard also. Uh, and it's the reason why a lot of corporate giving is skewed towards traditional charities. So you have a lot of charities and formal entities getting a lot of the resources, whereas, you know, ground-up groups such as Mother of Toastmasters or even folks like uh, Cassia before they were kind of uh, set up, um, were struggling to receive resources. So yes, definitely. Uh, I think this is, a this is a model that we've been piloting in the last two years. Uh, seems to have worked well, so maybe we can continue that uh, Thank you. I, I'm mindful of the time. It's 9.07. So um, maybe what I can do is I'll, I'll just say one quick thing on how to join the call if you're interested. And then if you have more questions, uh, please feel free to stay on and then we can have a, we can have a more Q&A. Uh, but if you'd like to leave or you need to leave, please, please feel free. Uh, so Remy, if you can put in the, um, maybe the link right, uh, to the membership application uh, form. Uh, so what, uh, if let's be interested, you can go to this website that Remy has uh, just shared, uh, submit in your uh, application, and then our membership team will get in touch with you. Uh, we are actually hoping to kind of do a membership drive from now until the 21st of September. Uh, so if you're interested, please feel free to you know, join us uh, and fill in the form uh, be uh, before then. And then uh, we will, uh, would love to welcome you into the community. If not, uh, uh, please feel free to stay on if you have any questions. Uh, if not, uh, thanks for joining us again and have a nice evening. Um, Vincent, sorry, do you have a okay. timeline for everyone to follow? Oh, yes. Uh, do you have a, Remy, do you have a, well, we are, we are looking to kind of uh, finalize the membership on 21st of September. So if you can uh, kind of indicate your uh, interest on this form, uh, and then we will get back to you with the official membership form. Uh, and we will need you to kind of send that in by 21st of September. So I would suggest maybe take the next week or so, or if you need to speak to your team or your different members of your uh, initiative. Uh, but membership will be in your personal capacity first. Uh. But that's not to say that you can't have an organization joining, uh, but the organization will need to be represented by an individual. Ah, so this was, I guess, a, a rough timeline. Uh. So once you fill in the form on this website, uh, we will send you the, uh, the, the bylaws and the membership form. And then you need to complete that by 21st of September and make your membership contribution by 30th of September. So that, that's the timeline. Thank you, Ash. Mm, yeah. And if I just also want to add one point for those of us who are part of groups and yeah. this idea of joining as an individual seems a bit difficult to swallow. The intent is that your group is actually uh, represented by you. Yeah. And so it can be an arrangement that you will be the, the representative of your group to the a good space but the membership is held by the individual and then like in the case of mother of toastmasters we can appoint the president as the as the representative for the club so yes. it's, it's meant to bring groups together as well yes and if the president change right you just need to transfer the membership so that's that's possible as well uh, even with the shares if you own shares any other questions one more thing to add on, um, because this is the first time we're doing an open house like this, but it won't be the last. If you know, if you know of any other friends or you know, just any any fellow volunteer, you know, who fellow volunteers who might be interested in learning more about a good space, just feel free to email us. So you see Remy's email over there, or yeah, just drop us a note, lah. Yeah, we are very open to having conversations. Um, yeah, we are at this stage of really growing the collective. We are very excited about the future. Mm. So, uh, just one question. Uh. So, if, if there are people resident in Singapore, but their change making is, is more than Singapore, let's say the region. Oh, maybe they still do something in Singapore, but maybe 
quite a lot of focus is on the overseas communities. Yeah. But they are resident in Singapore and, and maybe they fundraise in Singapore. Would they be eligible for membership in this uh, group space? Yeah, that's a great question, Anta. Thank you. Uh, so from I know the, the law, corporate, the cooperative people are here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from from the same court, please correct me if I or or, or monkey oh, as well wow. if I if I misrepresent. Uh, but my understanding is, uh, by the Singapore law, right, that there is a co cooperative act. A member of a co-op has to be a Singaporean or a Singapore resident. Is that correct? Yeah, Singapore? Correct, correct. Singapore or Singapore, so Singapore resident. Singapore resident means that uh, you are staying in Singapore like, and 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 most probably you're working here like. So, so in actual fact, so you look at the migrant worker, right? So they are working here on their passes. They are staying here. They have a residential address. So if today there's a migrant workers co-op, right? They can be members. But if one find day, of course, if they stop working, they no, they go back to their own country. Of course, their their membership will be terminated, lah. Yeah. So as long as you are Singapore residents, so, uh, you can join a co-op in Singapore. Yeah. Thank you, Anta. Yeah, thank and you whatever that. work you do, of course, up to you. <laughs> if it's aligned with a good space. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So now the, nine, the time is 9.12. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. If you can take a few moments right, to fill out the feedback form um, so that we can improve future run of this event, then that would be great. Um, yeah, and if you have any other questions, just feel free to email me. Um, I will drop the links in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I have two questions if I may. Yes. Sure. Evan mentioned earlier that your vision is, is a better Singapore. What does that look like? And the second question is how many members do you currently have? Great question. Uh, wow, the, 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 the first one, Evelyn, you want to Respond since you made the comment. I think, um, Jonathan, really good questions there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I can, I can draw from the, uh, you know, the, the collective dream making exercise that we had, uh, last year. Um, I think the Singapore that we envision is a very inclusive one, very diverse. There's certain, I mean, there are definitely qualities. You know, you know, we don't want to say values, but there are qualities that we are. Uh, looking at and these are the few that stood out. So very, very inclusive, um, diverse, as I mentioned, and also pushing innovation. Like, you know, we have creative, we are looking for creative ways of doing things. Uh, you know, that's part of it. Uh, Vincent, anything else you want to add on? I think there's a lot more, but yeah, these are the few that's popping to my mind right now. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, Jonathan, that's a wonderful question and we'd like to co-create that together. Mm. Um, and, and this is, I think, the richness of our diversity. Uh, what is the Singapore of our dreams? Yeah. I think for, for each of us, right, um, maybe Jonathan in the, tra in the traumatic brain injury space may have a different vision uh, than Louis, who's in the education space, than Amos, who's in the community development space, than Raymond, who's in the low-income community space. But I think what is really beautiful is when we come together, we create this dream together, which a, a co-op provides us the opportunities to do that. And then we see what are the intersections that, that, that we can work together to make this dream that we have, right, um, even more nuanced and even more uh, rich. Um, the second question was on... Uh, uh, members. How many members do we have? Members that we have, right? Um, Jonathan, yeah, I think, you know, uh, as mentioned, right, we are only formalizing the co-op application right now. So... Uh, existing change makers are still in the process of signing up, so we can't tell you the the hard numbers. Um, but I think earlier on, Vincent did share that um, in the loose collective that we had, you know, before it became a co-op, there were ninety two of us. Um, to be honest, I mean, we have to be frank. Not all ninety two will come on. Some of them um, uh, have shared that they don't feel ready to to yeah. um, you know, like maybe pay the the membership fee as of now. Uh, but we are also very excited at the prospects of having many new members come on board. Uh, so yeah, that's that's yeah. So that's where we are looking at right now. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're looking. I think hundred and twenty in the first year, and then uh, working was two hundred in the second year, and uh, three hundred in the third year. I think. Yeah, and I, I think it's kind of like a responsibility for everyone in the co-op as well. When we come in, right, we don't just be passive consumers. So it's mm -hmm. a bit different from, you know, you go to a business and you consume products and services. But uh, when you do, if, if you do decide to uh, come on board and apply for the membership, 
um, we highly encourage members to contribute. And this could mean like even doing things like, uh, like you mentioned, uh, you know, shaping the dream that we want to see. It could be uh, drafting a community manifesto for the collective. Uh, it could be doing things like recruiting members. So we all have to kind of play our bit. Um, oh, yeah. oh, Owen actually asked a really good question. Is there a maximum number of shares in this co-op? Uh, I... We didn't set a number in our bylaws, uh, but and this is maybe saying quite you can also help out. Is I, I do remember that the the nature of a share in a co-op is quite interesting. Uh, it will never appreciate, so it will it will uh, never appreciate nor will it ever de depreciate. So it will stay at a par par value. So if let's say you you uh, the share is uh, I think ten ten dollars a share now. Um, if you kind of like so called cash out right at the end of year three or year four, uh, your 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 shares you will still be ten dollars per share. Saying quite is. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. So it's on par value, yeah. So co-op share is, is is not like those type of listed company. Yeah. <laughs> so if you if you want to join a co-op and hope that your share will appreciate, then co-op is not for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so co-op is a is a is a sustainable social enterprise, a form of sustainable social enterprise whereby whereby all the members have a stake in it and it's for long term purpose. And if the co-op makes money. Uh, dividends will be given out to, to the members lah, if, if, if you vote for it. Oh, yeah. I think one more thing to take note about this is that uh, no members can hold more than 20% of the shares. Oh, okay. Okay? No, more, no, no members, uh, even if you are the founding member or whatever member, you cannot hold more than 20%. This is under the act. Uh. Okay? okay, and just, just to, just to uh, add on what Sengwan have shared. Or when you would you like to bring your voice in to maybe share the context behind your question or maybe oh I, I was just curious that's all um um yeah because I, mean, I was um i was just thinking like yeah maybe a few years later the the membership or the the share the cost of your share might have to rise like you know from ten dollars to twenty dollars yeah. <laughs> so you know how would you uh, does that mean the the percentage? Because if you're holding, if you bought like ten dollars a share now, and then you know maybe five years later that that guy pays twenty bucks a share, you know how how would that affect your your dividends? You know, just from yeah. a financial perspective. Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Uh, my my understanding of the dividends, Owen, is that uh, the dividends is split according to the uh, number, the proportion of shares that you own. Mm. Correct, right? Yeah, correct. yeah, and the, the interesting thing about a co-op is, you know, in a public listed company, um, you, you have more shares, you have more say, right? Uh, but in a co-op, uh, everyone has one vote, regardless of how many shares you own. So you can own 100 shares, you still have one vote. You can own 1,000 shares, you still have one vote. Oh, cool. Thanks. I think one more thing by Zhong Han, right? Just to, just to, just to answer a question, like, can the co-op own private limited company? The answer is yes. Uh. The co-op can own private limited company, but do take note that a private limited company cannot own a co-op. Uh. Okay? Yeah. So I hope I answer your question in the chat. Uh. And, and, and what this means, right, is also, uh, maybe saying if you can share or monkey the example of Running Hour, or how Running Hour uses a, a kind of charitable organization that they own as a co-op to fundraise. Uh, no, not not running hour. Not running hour. It's, oh, not yeah. running um, okay, so so if you look at the Singapore co-op landscape, it's quite interesting. Uh, um, there's such thing called community co-op also. Uh, it, it, it's not a new idea. If you if you if you Google uh, overseas, there are community co-op also. So so there's there's such a structure called community co-op. Alright. So if you look at running hour, running hour is a co-op, alright. Um, but they don't do business. Uh, they don't do business and they are run by volunteers, all right? So they don't get paid. Uh, uh, so where do they get their money from? Um, so they, every year they will have this uh, run for everyone, right? I can't remember the name of the, the running event. So at running hour, every year they will have, uh, have a running event, okay? And then from this running event, they will so-called earn from their registration fee, lah. Of course, sponsorship, everything. So the, the sponsorship plus the registration fee and so on and so forth will will be the so-called revenue. All right. So uh, so sometimes some years they have surplus, a bit of surplus. Some years they don't have. All right. But but that's running our way of doing things. All right. So they are they are basically their members are all volunteers. So every week, if you if you follow their Facebook, they will have events. Now because of COVID, they have virtual run event with their 
beneficiary which are actually PWDs or either visually handicapped or special needs or things like that. So, so, so that's how they run it. Another community based co op is East Coast. All right. East Coast, uh, they are sort of set up by MHA. La. Oh, they are linked to MHA. All right. so, so their goal is to rehabilitate uh, ex offenders back to the society by helping them uh, find jobs. Uh, by, by doing sort of emotional uh, uh, repair among their family members and things like that, all right? So, uh, their members are actually ex this ex offender all right? So, they have, I think, 15,000 members, all right? So, all these ex offender okay, that come clean and, 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 and man they manage to, to, to rehabilitate, they become a member of this cause. And for those who are who are basically uh, stay clean for X number of years, uh, they do well in society. They want to contribute back, right? They will volunteer as East Coast Titans, right? So East Coast Titan, they'll do motivation talk to the schools and things like that, all right? Uh, so East Coast, you look, if you look at it, also as a co-op, they don't do business. So where do they get their money from? Again, sponsorship. So the bulk of their income come from sponsorship, all right? Because of their connection, right? All right. And also recently last year, last year they set up a charity arm called East Coast Regen. So it's IPC status. Okay. So this East Coast Regen, uh, you can Google it. All right. It's a it's a IPC charity. So they can openly go out and solicit for for donation and so on and so forth. Uh, how many percentage of those donation goes back to the East Coast Co-op? The, the part uh, I'm not too sure yet. Uh, because this charity was just set out, I think, in 2019, all right, but also not easy. They have to go through a lot of process, all right, you know, government now. Right? So these are the two, if you ask me, community-based co-op uh, in Singapore right now. Huh? Uh, but of course, we hope that a good space is not like that. Huh? <laughs> because I, I really believe that a good space, you all have something valuable to offer. Huh? I, I really believe that with all of your fantastic mind and skill set, I really believe that y'all can do a business, all right, to actually sustain yourself without relying on sponsorship, without relying on, on, on funding. Yeah. So, so, so that's my personal belief. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Sinkwan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rox, Dan, would you like to share your question? Um, sure. So um, I was asking uh, in the chat group that uh, I wonder what is the, the good space take on controversial topics. Um, though I will say controversial topic because this is not a nine uh, with the mainstream approach. Um, like I'm in the mental health field, and uh, this is not. It's not just. It's actually the. It's a systemic thing. It's really linked to our media, the professional training. Um, how um, the interventions being done, as in, or, or rather being delivered to the service user. Uh, like, like, I think I'll get into, I think it's very, uh, I think there's so much details. This is something that's not taught here in Singapore and um, um, including the education here. Because right now, currently, as with uh, Western country, UK, US, Australia, and Westernized country, Singapore, and probably Hong Kong, we use a biomedical approach towards mental health. And needs are being uh, perpetrated. I, I, because I noticed in the, um, I think a good space, there's this war or something, right? I noticed somebody, this anonymous, wrote about chemical imbalance. That is actually a myth. It is true. And then, to be honest, I'm in the, I'm in the field. Um, I, I had senior colleagues who... It's a bad thing to share, I think, tell this to clients, even though um, there's no research that's been done that the chemicals, which means the neurotransmitter in the brain can be measured directly, and it's linked to any psychiatric classification. I use the word classification that's because like psychiatric diagnosis, there's no objective test that can be done, meaning that like, there's no blood test, x-ray, even though these terms are, being, are so um, common and it has been uh, perpetrated in every facade, um, be professional education, um, media, well, whatever. It's not that I'm so smart that I know this because I came to uh, across um, UK 
um, as I was applying for the doctorate in clinical psychology program and the UK trained clinical psychologist um, shared this with me, like um, the alternative uh, approaches. Though alternative sounds like, hey, this is like being a side nine, but um, like British Psychological Society had came up with it and they wrote letters against the American Psychiatry Association when they published the DSM Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 in 2013. Um, like, hey, there's like a, a astronomical increase in the psychiatric classification and and uh, actually I know Owen, we kind of know this as in like um, this medicalization of human distress is uh, a norm in Singapore and, and in many of the country. And then um, it is really a huge topic. And then I know um, this seems like this sounds very anti psychiatry -ish, which is not because um, there's a movement called critical psychiatry, like taking a step back and evaluate the fundamental assumption towards those mental health issues. Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure whether I <laughs> summarize it um, well, because I like, you know this is something that like, is very, very controversial, especially as we first heard about it. And then I was thinking like, wow, I mean, because in UK, there's a critical psychiatry um, network and all their members are psychiatrists, only psychiatrists can join. And there are critics, very strong critics to, against their own profession, where how that profession um, become one that is just prescribing chemicals to treat the so-called chemical imbalance in the brain. Whereas um, a few decades earlier, there's this thing called social psychiatry, where the psychiatrists in the past, they learned psychotherapy and it's being used uh, substantially, but it depends on the context as a child. So yeah, I'm also sure whether I talk too much. Oh, thanks, Roxanne, for sharing. Wow. Uh, what, I, what was the term they used? The medicalization of, of what again? Sorry. The medicalization of human distress. So, oh. so yeah. So it's like, oh, why wow, you? It's, so so the, our biomedical system is like, okay, like five out of nine criteria, you'll get depression. So it means like having this, you will create the segregation of like human is divided into two subgroups. One, is unwell, mentally ill, those who have got a labor, psychiatric diagnosis, those, they are well, I am well. Even with the movement currently what Singapore is having, sorry to say, <laughs> in the mental health sector, they are like my partners, la. like, like, the, like the beyond the labor stuff, right? Um, like sharing a personal story, the, sto the sharing a personal story, it can also continue this me for chemical imbalance. Yeah, and personality disorder is there's no scientific validation. Like there's um there's no there's lack of reliability and uh, validity. Everyone can just Google, it's quite easy to um see the um that the field is is um it's not based on science, but because there's a lot of influence on the pharmaceutical company, it's a huge issue and is also it's related to social control. Um social control in a sense where instead of looking at issues like poverty, discrimination, that leads to a person having a mental health distress, once I assign a psychiatric label to the person, I think, hey, hey now the problem becomes resides within the person, instead of looking at the context. And then when, it does not just happen for psychiatrists, even for a counselor like me, I think when I first started working, it's like all about this person just need to take psychiatric drugs and this person just need to take it for the rest of their life. And, and so I'm kind of like the, a me like the odd one out in my <laughs> workplace, la. like, like um, having um, such a view and, and um, but I know I'm not the only one because I'm, um, I have spoken to um, people who are trained in the UK, um, UK and who else? Yeah, eventually, yeah, they are really exposed to it because I've been through the interview, the professor know what I'm talking about, then I feel very at home when I speak to them. But here it's a different thing. La. I never hear of any psychiatry talk something against their own profession, not tiring their own profession down, but rather it's about taking a step back. And then it's because it's such a, I'm just in this job. And then see people going through the, I don't know, the, 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 the adverse effect of psychiatry drugs. And having family members say, hey, you need to take it for the rest of your life. And if you're not taking it, it's like you're not being compliant. You see, compliant, that becomes a power difference. 
Yeah. And yeah, it's kind of say so much thing that it's it's really heartbreaking. Yeah. It's really heartbreaking, and it's 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 yeah, it, it touch on all aspects of our life, and mental health is yeah, everyone has it. I mean, even though we may not have loved ones, we may not be in a profession, but sometimes we can just stigmatize ourselves for feeling upset or for a certain period of like, oh, am I going to have depression or anxiety disorder, that kind of stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Roxanne, I just wanted to jump in and like empathize yeah. a lot with like your sharing. It was yeah. really passionate and I could feel it. Um, and I want to empathize with that because um, I, I sense that a lot of that uh, frustration and struggle comes also from like this sense of like you are the only one doing this and part of the loneliness in this cause that you believe in. Um, and I, I feel like I've been there before and it feels like your partners are everywhere around the world but they are not here. Um, I just suggest that um, there's a lot of similarity among what you're saying, as well as some of the causes that we believe in. Um, there are these things that we are frustrated about, and um, part of that change-making work is then not only to talk about it, but to start to build our communities, to start to build the levers, build the red credibility, uh, our networks, and so on to move things. So um, I'd say that um, your passion <laughs> makes you a perfect fit for this space and it's the ongoing work that we'll be involved in to move this forward. Lah. Um, on my own personal experience, right, I was mentioning earlier that uh, I care a lot about education and like five, six years ago, I was already talking about how we need to look at how students, what their aspirations, what they want to do, but it's only now during COVID that people suddenly say, hey, oh, our graduates cannot find job, all these traineeship stuff. Uh, it's only coming to fruit now, but part of the journey is in the journey. Lah. And um, I think we'll be very happy. All of us here are very interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, and we're happy to host that on another time. Lah. And we can talk even more about this. A ton of other folks who will be very passionate to hear about you also. And I think uh, just to add on, thank Louis for that and just to add on uh, Roxanne so um, absolutely true that a lot of us uh, the change makers in this space right we we have you know very strong views about certain things so I'm a speech therapist right and I you know and I, I see you know patients every day uh, but actually at the Fasia SG we are what we are advocating is a completely different model almost like we are moving we are steering it away from uh, what what the mainstream well, it's not, it's not really not say like not mainstream, but we are actually advocating a different view of, point of view. We are saying, you know, let's look at them not as patients, even though I use that term, right, but as holistic individuals who are capable of doing things. And we are saying empowerment. We want them to do this, do that. Whereas, you know, uh, in the doctors in, in the acute hospitals would say, no, 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 okay, let's just, you know, like ship them out and, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't say that our programs are rehab or whatever. So it's actually a... A different way of thinking and um, I think coming to a good space I wasn't even sure you know like who will care about aphasia and everything but change makers have been very open to learning and really just listening uh, and and I think especially when what you're saying right is backed by research overseas right because what I'm saying also is backed by research overseas and I think you can definitely bring uh, whatever evidence you have lah. Um, so as an individual we hold certain values certain beliefs so as a good space as a co-op we are a neutral space. So, you know, there is that. We are a neutral space. So it's not like I will ask a good space to say, oh, the way I'm doing things is the only way, is the right way, the only way for aphasia. But I think um, it's definitely a very inclusive open space uh, for you to share your views. And I, I believe everybody will be uh, more than happy to hear your point of view about this. I mean, I'm interested to find out more. Um, uh, Roxanne, this is Ash here. I just also wanted to chime in on one point here. Your main question at the start was how will we handle differing views within our community, right? And then you, exp and then you explain your contentious view. Um, and what I wanted to add here is that um, I, I am a parent of a special needs child, right? And I will have this term in my head about chemical imbalance from the very long time. So I've subscribed to that view. Right, but I know you don't. You don't, right? So what I want to say is that in our community, we uh, cherish the openness of this space, whereby we acknowledge that no one is complete in our understanding, and we want to try to understand both sides. Right. So we need to find a way to bridge this uh, difference in view, and I fully believe that this group 
because we are all on the same boat, we are all change makers wanting to make the world better. If we cannot understand differing views amongst this group, I think there's no chance in the world. That's why I'm actually very positive that if you have a different view, this is a platform where you can help the rest of us understand your view. And at the same time, we will have the chance to explain our perspective. And then somewhere in that discussion, we should come to a consensus or agree to disagree. Right? And then we may know that certain parts of the topics, we will not have consensus across the whole group, but it shouldn't um, limit what we do as a community. All right? So this is one point that we discussed in the uh, a Good Space uh, board meeting where we said that one idea that we were uh, toying with is that you don't need consensus before we take action. As long as a few good change makers, sorry, a few change makers think it's a good idea and we can come together. And as long as the idea doesn't conflict the principles of our organization, then we wouldn't hold back. So meaning that you don't have to convince everyone that chemical imbalance is wrong, right? But you just have to convince enough of your group that says we need to do something about making a difference. Uh, a good space can be the platform to help. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense. And, and um, just, actually, just when I ask the question, because um, uh, that one, um, because it's it kind of against the psychiatric, it, it seems like against the psychiatric profession. And, and so I'm just asking from the perspective, like, hey, if let's say, like a good, good space is going to put a name towards an event that seems to be against that huge profession, then, then I don't know, I'm not so sure as in what's the thoughts mm. from a good space. Because it's, I, I suppose it's unlike like other um, social issues like environmental issue or, or migrant worker issues. I'm not saying these issues are lesser or what, but then I'm just asking from that perspective like in terms of talking about such contentious topic yeah. um, in Singapore in particularly. Yeah, I can share from from history uh, and I think the wider question is also like as an organization, how does a good space advocate for for issues? And I think Tom Khan also asked that uh, question as well. Uh, so from history, right, we have had hosted activities uh, with the LGBTQ community before. Uh, we've had also in the mental health space, right, hosted uh, the event of this change maker called Tricia Tan from Catalyst Connection that was looking at uh, something similar where she 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 is a person in recovery for mental health. And uh, her activity was really this idea that uh, a mental health condition, uh, it's not just caused uh, by a chemical imbalance, there are other so, uh, socially related factors as well. Um, so definitely, I, I think we, this is something that we can explore. Um, with um, what Ifli mentioned, uh, a good space, and also Ash mentioned, uh, a good space as a, as a neutral space, uh, that it, it, there are things that we are against though, and I think this is something that we as a community have to chart. Uh, we are against things like maybe hate, hate speech, uh, we are against things like racism. So, so in creating an, an inclusive space doesn't mean that we have to be inclusive of everything, but there are, I think, some things that we have to do to create the, the uh, boundaries. Uh, so that's one piece. Uh, I think the second question I'd like to show it to maybe Dines or Evelyn Ash, if, if you will, right? Uh, how, how do we think about collective advocacy? Because I think what Roxanne mentioned is very valid. Say, um, there, there are two ways this could, uh, we, we, we could do it. Um, one is that we can, um, a good space can front it. So similar uh, to how Ash did his SG Gratitude Pack, uh, a good space fronted it. Uh, or a good space can be a signatory on it. So uh, say like someone in the, uh, one of the change makers, like say Roxanne, for example, you want to put up a position paper to the government um, for, for this piece of uh, kind of like, uh, for, for, for this position that you want to advocate for and you want a good space to kind of sign off on that. Uh, so those are two modes, but I'll leave maybe Tines and Ash or Ethan to uh, share, you know, what, 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 what have we been thinking about with regards to that? Yeah. So the, the comment I made earlier this, is that we agreed that we do not have to have consensus before we support a project, right? So as long as it falls within our principles, so we have to have yet to define what those principles are. Um, but we were quite clear that it's not going to be value-based principles, right? It's going to be neutrals in principles. So as long as a group of you feel that something's important and you can mobilize X number of members to say that we want to do this, right? And it, as long as it doesn't conflict with our principles, in the main, I think the board should support, right? Um, 
and whether we run it with the, a good space fronting or whether we run it as supporting, that can be open to, to discussion because there could be many factors around this. Yeah, but the main goal is to maximize the impact of that agenda. So if we, I do it alone, I get only so much. But if I work with a good space, I can get so much more. That would be sure. my view on it. Yeah, maybe I can just add a bit. I'll take it back to uh, when I first met Vincent at NVPC in I think 2017, if I'm right. And uh, my understanding of a good space then was uh, it was to give people a safe space to start a conversation, especially about an issue that they are passionate about. I mean, uh, when it comes to our membership, all that we're going with the corporate side, where you know it's like a social enterprise with uh, members who have, I would say, a similarity or wanting to do good, looking at the greater good and all that. I think those are the things we'll stick to. But I think, yeah, be it if we we want to ensure that we for good. I mean, issues that align with us. I mean, we don't talk about racism and hate and all that, but issues that might be a bit opposing as well. We want to take a stand where we are going to allow the conversation. I think that's the very first step that we, we will take on our side, especially in the committee as well, because when, when it comes to driving things forward, the committee is going to be taking uh, quite a bit, making quite a bit of decisions as well. So I think that's something we will do. And of course, you know, when it comes to certain activ activities and all, there may be two different uh, organizations with two opposing views. But the key thing that we want to share in a good space is if you're both doing good and if you need uh, certain support from the rest of the members, I think that's where we can step in as well. I think uh, for me, it's always been a bit, uh, so I run a social enterprise, it's outdoor adventure. Uh, but when we actually entered a good space, it was, uh, we were connected by one of the ladies from Race, uh, Serene from Race, and it just gave us opportunity to just help as much as possible. So like myself and my, my staff and my team members come in as well, we don't really, uh, it's not that we don't bother about the different issues, but if somebody needs help, we just see how we can uh, help. But I think, yeah, I, I think that is the idea behind the good space as well, wherever we can, get ourselves in to help you uh, push your objectives slightly further or look for collaboration between the other members. That's something we will work hard to try to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for that. Oh. <laughs> no, I was just wondering, uh, Roxanne, does that help? Does that answer your queries in any way? Coming from an is quite open. I'm not uh, finalized, like, in a process. Because it can be uh, sounds like hearing what's being said, it sounds like it can be either like like uh, me or some some a few people who representing certain entity, and then with the backup from AGS or AGS, it can be using AGS as a name itself as a collective to push uh, push forth um, whatever advocacy. Yes. Am I right? Yes. And then that whatever decision making factor, be principles or criteria, um, that is to be discussed for the more like, for in time to come. Yeah. yeah. So then I think we are a very good space for you to start lah to just have this conversation about the topic you're passionate about, right? Um, because, uh, I think, you, you know, like I think the sense that I'm getting from you is that, uh. You, you, you try talking and then you feel like it's so against all the mainstream, you know, medical, you know, healthcare professionals, they all like slam you left, right, center. So don't worry, uh, none of that here because um, there are other mental wellness practitioners and actually very diverse, very, very diverse, um, you know, uh, backgrounds and beliefs or so. So I think this is a very good space to start small and we can be your test bed. And then, you know, when you scale it up, right, you know, it might give you a good, I think, yeah, starting point as to how you want to uh, advance your cause, yeah. Especially when there's evidence overseas, you know. Even though it may be counter or deemed as alternative, I think I think it's okay. Yeah. 